Daisy, nor Denford, nor Daisy's Andrew. Was right behind. Okay, so should we here? Okay, so we are going to continue talking about light. We had this slide at the end of the last class period talking about the spectrum of light and this very important relationship that, of course, stands out brightly. Good. Very important relationship that the speed of light is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. The speed of light in vacuum is a special value. We give it the symbol C, and that speed of light in vacuum is 299792458 meters per second. Now, I actually saw a, a message, I it was one of those spam things from, it's a place called Quora. I don't even know what it's from or what it is. But somebody was saying, you know, that number is so close to three. Do you think it's some, you know, some sign of how God created the universe? How would you answer if somebody made that suggestion? Okay, Colby's shaking his head. Can you be more, <laughs> more complete in your answer? Uh, I mean, that number, whether or not it's close to three, is just our representation. Like, it's pretty much arbitrary. It's just our, our way of putting some sort of value to it. It wasn't God putting a value to it. That's our, our representation of what its speed is. So it's really not right. anything to do with that. And I completely agree with Colby's thinking here. The definition of a meter and a definition of a second come together to make that number very close to three. But the definition of meter has gone through a lot of various definitions. And that's why I say they should have just fudged it a little to make it three. Um, somebody, in a, after a whole bunch of people had nonsense replies, somebody had a good reply where he talked about the history of the meter with a lot more detail actually than I give you guys in class and it did include something I had never thought about they wanted to make sure that they didn't invalidate previous measurements that is they did say okay the guy had this number at that time but now we've changed the definition so it's actually this number that he should have had and so they wanted to be able to keep the historicity of previous experiments and that's why they didn't fudge it just change the meter a little bit to make it exactly three now, I've broached that idea. Has anyone heard the fine-tuning argument regarding, you know, why there must be a God? Tyler has. Anyone else? Tyler, would you explain, as best you understand, what the fine-tuning argument is? That the values of all the parameters necessary for life are... Like, they couldn't be moved even a little bit, like gravity and nuclear forces. They couldn't even be moved a little bit um, and have life still exist. Okay, that's, that's the basis of the argument. You have constants that if they were changed by one part in 10 to the 20th, you just change it by one part in 10 to the 20th, and all of a sudden, life as we know it can't exist. The universe as we know it can't exist if the density of the universe was changed by just that amount. Now, scientists have come up with some arguments like the inflationary model for the, what happened right after the Big Bang. Um, new forces became accessible, and those new forces caused a very rapid expansion in the universe. And that rapid expansion would cause the density to come very close to the critical value necessary for the universe to remain around instead of have already disappeared. But things like Fred Hoyle, who rejected the Big Bang Theory because he was an atheist, and he said there'd have to be a god to actually start this Big Bang process. When he was studying carbon atoms and the stability of a carbon nucleus, he said that you, know, you would have to have exactly this value for a certain parameter, or you couldn't have a stable carbon nucleus. And then he did some studying, found that that parameter was exactly the value that he said it had to be. And he was like, that's impossible. It's impossible for a universe to just have randomly formed 
and had this value, just the precise value. And so he started believing there had to be a God, not a Christian God, but that there had to be a God because it was just inconceivable that you could have had this occur. That's basically the same thing, the fine-tuning argument, that there has to be some kind of designer to have made the parameters in our laws of physics such that it's possible to have a universe in life. So that is a legitimate argument about the numbers, right? Because that's not based on our measurement of the numbers or our randomly defined systems of measurements, but the actual value, no matter what units you use, has to be that refined. Okay, I wasn't planning on talking about that, but I always like to bring up a few theological topics from time to time, and that just came to mind. So, a little example of how to use that equation. Oh my goodness, Daisy, I didn't put up the homework yet, did I? Daisy's usually the one who reminds me when I haven't made it available on Moodle. I will do it before noon, okay? okay. <laughs> um, it's good to have somebody who keeps me, you know, on top of things. I, I saw you doing your homework, Michaela. That's what reminded me. Okay, so I apologize for not getting that up earlier. Using this equation, since the equation was frequency multiplied by wavelength is equal to speed, then I can find the frequency from that equation simply by dividing both sides by wavelength. So I have frequency is speed over wavelength. Remember I said on Monday that number 299792458, you can just call it 300, 000, or 300 million. Don't call it 300,000. Three times 10 to the 8. So for speed, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by this given wavelength of 10 meters, and that's 3 times 10 to the 7. That's how you convert. So it's very simple if you know the frequency, you know the wavelength, and vice versa. Or as you did in lab for sound waves, you knew the wavelength and frequency, and what did you find? This requires thinking back to Monday. The speed. Interesting things about the spectrum. How we make electromagnetic waves depends on the frequency. For radio waves and microwaves, we use things like I showed in the lecture on Monday. Things like an antenna, and that antenna I make current go up and current go down. So I have current that goes up and then current that goes down. And it makes alternating magnetic and electric fields. For radio waves and microwaves, that's what we do. So your cell phone, does your cell phone have an antenna? You don't see the antenna. 10, 15 years ago, you would have seen the antenna. Now they have antenna, antennae, that's the plural of antenna. They have antennae inside so you don't see them. You might recall when the iPhone 4 came out, the antenna is along the side of the phone. And if you touch it, you ground where you're touching generally, which affects the efficiency of the antenna. So, like, I did a little experiment on my bed. Here's my phone on my bed. I've got three bars. I touch it. I've got none. How did Apple respond, by the way? Yeah. At first, Steve Jobs said, you're just holding it wrong. You just have to hold the phone differently. It works great. It's not a design flaw. It's a user error holding the phone wrong. Then they said, okay, okay. Okay, so it really is a problem. They gave you a free cover because then you're not going to touch it. And they redesigned the operating system so it changed the algorithm for showing how many bars it was. Because the algorithm they had used before basically showed five bars down to a fairly weak signal. And then it was just a small range that went from five bars to no bars. And so they spread it out so you had to have a stronger signal to see five and you would see more change. So going from three to zero had been a very small change in strength. Now it's a bigger change in strength. Don't mean to bash on Steve Jobs or Apple here, especially because I love my iPhone. But those are issues with antennae. So usually the antennae are something inside the case that you can't touch. So radio waves, and microwaves generated by accelerating charges, X-rays come from electrons dropping from higher energy states to lower energy states. So those come from inside an atom. 
And gamma rays come from the nucleus of an atom. Now, there are other ways of making light in between, like visible light. These lights here are caused by electrons falling down to lower energy levels. If you have an incandescent light bulb, the tradi traditional light bulbs that are being phased out that have a little wire filament in there, that wire just gets hot, and it gives off visible light because it's hot enough. So we have different ways that we produce these waves. <clears throat> It was Sir Isaac Newton that showed that white is not itself a color. White is a combination of colors. And in fact, what we perceive as white is just colors all the way across the visible spectrum. So the visible spe spectrum, remember on Monday I talked about the Roy G. Biv thing. You have these colors of light. The Roy G. Biv colors, those are colors that you can make with a single frequency. And, of course, it's a continuum, so you could come up with an infinite number of names for single frequencies if you so desired. But white is not a single frequency. White is a combination of multiple frequencies. And, of course, what's the opposite of white? Black. Black is no light. Black's not a color. Black is the lack of any light. And so other things, you know... White is not a color, but it's a combination of colors. When we look at things and we perceive a color, we're just judging how much of the colors of each of the kinds of colors we can perceive are present. By the way, the prism, we call this action right here dispersion. Dispersion because it's dispersing the colors. And that occurs because different colors travel with different speeds through anything that's not a vacuum. So in this case, the uh, red light goes faster and the blue light goes slower. And because of those differences in speeds, when you go through the prism, the colors separate. That's why back when I was like in first grade, when we got our homework turned in, we could play with the prism. And my classmates would take it up and look at, you know, sunlight comes through the prism and all oh, the pretty colors. Look at the wall, the pretty colors. And, of course, what do you think Richard did? It was a nice big prism. So I put that nice big prism up to my eyes. And the, the prism, you can have a reflection off of the internal surface. We call it total internal reflection. So I would see everything upside down and try to walk around with everything upside down. Because I was destined for something different, apparently. It's like when I got my little car set, you know, we can go fast in little toy cars, electric cars. First thing I did was take the cars apart to see how they worked. <laughs> My dad was all, I think he's probably going to be a scientist. That's not, not what normal people do with their cars. And of course, how many people took a car, to have taken apart one of those cars? Okay, so you have a little electric motor in there, right? You've got the windings, just like you made in lab. You've got the magnets. Well, I was like, magnets? I like magnets. They're fun to play with. Furthermore, I don't want them in my car because that just makes the car heavier. And if it's heavier, it won't speed up as fast and it won't slow down as fast. So I took the magnets out. I put the car back together and put it on the track. And guess what happened? It didn't work. It didn't work. Why not? I didn't have the magnets. An electric motor is using magnetism. And so then I was scared that I'd broken it forever. But I put the magnets in and fortunately it worked. You can put the magnets in backward, and then it won't work as well. But I guess I got lucky. It was a 50-50 there. Um, actually, I could have also made it so it ran backwards. So 50-50 on it running. Another 50-50 on if it's running, it runs forward versus backward. If you say so. Some might find it entertaining. Okay, how does the eyeball work? Our eyeballs are pretty amazingly complex things. Coming back to the idea of origins, eyeballs are reasonably similar across the entire animal kingdom. There are variations, to be sure. I mean, you look at a cat's eye, you see a definite difference. But there are general, you know, the general features of the eye are pretty much the same across a broad variety of animals. Evolutionarily speaking, you would have to have had the eyeball pretty much completed 
at the time of the diver divergence between different species if they have essentially the same eyeball. And so taking things that have eyeballs similar to ours, you would actually have to go back to the Cambrian explosion, which is believed to be 542 million years ago, when we went from essentially having a bunch of little, they're not insects, multi-segmented animals that lived in water, to a vast variety of animals in the geologic column, you had to have the eyeballs pretty much completed there. It's a pretty complicated order to, organ to be completed when we consider it was, according to science, the low level complexities at that time, you know, the very lowest level. It's the bottom of the, of the evolutionary cycle there. Another reason why I can't see good reason to believe in evolutionary theory. Okay, so how is the eye so amazing? The first thing on the eye that the light comes to technically is the sclera, right? We have a, a layer of, well, membrane that covers the cornea, and that's the sclera. As you can see in this picture, we physicists don't talk about that. In fact, I, wasn't, I never really thought about it until I had two students who their parents were both ophthalmologists. And so ophthalmologists are the people who know the eyeball inside and out. I'm talking about, so the first thing light hits is the cornea, and yeah, no, it's not, it's the sclera. Yeah, well, okay, sit down, learn some more. The cornea is what we physicists consider the first thing. The cornea is basically a piece of material that gives the eyeball its shape. That is the, the front of the eyeball its shape. And so it shapes it so that light that comes in actually gets bent. We'll learn about refraction on Friday. But the light gets bent by the cornea. And if it gets bent, then those light rays, if we had initially parallel rays, that is light coming from very far away, it's basically coming in as all parallel lines. They would come and meet together at the back of the eyeball because of the action of the cornea. And so the cornea is actually our primary focusing element. Focusing meaning it brings the light together. After that, you go through what's called the aqueous humor, which just means the liquid that's behind that cornea. And then you get to the iris. When you think of the iris, what do you think of? The color of your eyes. The iris we think of as color because that's what gives your eyes the color. It's the color of the iris. But in terms of the function of the eyeball, the color of your eye is not the function there. In terms of the function, there is a hole in that iris. We call the hole the pupil. And the iris can get bigger or smaller. And by getting bigger or smaller, if it's bigger, it's going to allow more light in. If it's smaller, it allows less light in. So a big well, the primary purpose of this iris here is to control how much light can actually get into the eyeball. If it's low light conditions, it should open up. If it's bright light conditions, it should close down. Our brain controls that. Our brain controls that as long as we haven't been doing something stupid like taking drugs or drinking alcohol. Or getting hit in the head. Right. That will also mess this up. So as an EMT, when I responded to a call... After establishing, you know, my ABCs, the person has an airway and they're breathing and they have circulation. You know, the heart's working and, and blood is moving around. Um, then we go to things like establishing how well their brain is working. You know, are they oriented to time, place, person? You know, sometimes people don't know who they are. Sometimes they don't know what time it is. And then we check their eyes. And so, now, Andrew, are you an EMT? So when you check a person's eye, what do you do? You just take a little light, have them look at you, go slide, and see if it changes. And you do both sides. And you do both sides. What should happen with a normal person? Pupils equal responsive to light. Pupils equal responsive to light. I never actually said pearl. I just said equal and responsive. Um, so when you shine the light in, the pupil should quickly get smaller. When you take the light away, usually use your other hand to give it some shadow, the pupil should quickly get larger. What happens if a person is drunk? 
Okay, sluggish or non-existent response. What if they're on drugs? One might. <laughs> One might do it. Or you can have things like it goes, whee, it gets bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. These are signs that their brain is not working properly. A traumatic brain injury. If somebody's got an injury of the brain, it will also respond in things. What do you say about a person if you shine the, if their pupil is huge, they have a blown pupil, you shine the light in there and there's no change. Yeah, I know. It's EMT, that's it. My first call is EMT. I was scared to death I was going to kill somebody. After, you know, like the 50th call or so, I'm like, I can't do anything. All I do is package them up so they don't die in transport and get them to a hospital. It took a lot of pressure off when I realized that. EMTs, yeah, they don't really do much of saving of lives. They preserve you to get to you to somebody who can save it. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I said, it felt really good. John Lamb and I used to high five after every call where a patient didn't die. No, and the rules you guys should know, patients never die. They were either dead when you got there or they lived until you got them to the hospital. They taught you that, right? What happens if they die in the rig? If they die in the rig, your rig becomes a crime scene. and doesn't get released to you for a few hours. So <laughs> when a person's in the rig, they're going to be alive when they get to the hospital. They may not be breathing or their heart beating, but they're alive. <laughs> it's a tactical thing. <laughs> you get them off, you roll them into the ER, and the doctor may say, he's dead. I don't know, he's fine on the rig. <laughs> Pulse rate of zero. Okay, let's get on topic again. So the iris... It's kind of a window to see how the brain is working because if the pupil isn't responding right, we know that there's been, as my teacher said, an insult to the brain. Then we have this part that's the lens. This picture calls it the accommodating lens. I believe this comes from our textbook, yeah. Accommodating lens. What does the accommodating lens do? <laughs> it's accommodation. But what is accommodation? If I was an accommodating teacher, what would I do? I do what? Give us all A's. I don't know if that would be so much accommodating as dishonest, but if you all earn A's, by the way, I'm happy to award all A's, but I don't give them. You have to earn them. What, is, what does accommodating mean? If I'm an accommodating host, something that we actually use the term what is an accommodating host compared to a non-accommodating host? Accommodating host helps you get the things you need. Well, the accommodation of the eyeball is adjustment to give you the thing you need, that is, to allow you to see clearly. The accommodating lens, it allows you to change the focus. What that means is it allows you to focus on things that are nearby. Just the cornea alone should, if everything was perfect, allow you to see distant things just fine. But you wouldn't see near things. So, as far as I'm concerned, Andrew right now is distant. Anything over a couple meters is distant. And so, I might be able to focus on Andrew just fine without that lens accommodating. But if I look at Michaela... She's closer, and she would be out of focus. I have muscles, these ciliary muscles. You see the ciliary muscles? <laughs> Let me change to black. You see the ciliary muscles here and down here? Those muscles will change the shape of that lens. And in so doing, they change how much it bends the light. And so they allow you to adjust what you're focusing on. Then you have this big region here that's called the vitreous humor. I think it's spelled like that. Over here in front, it was the aqueous humor. And yeah, I think that's a British spelling of humor. It's obviously not the way we spell humor for funny haha. And I didn't want to spell it the way we spell honey, ha, funny ha-ha, so I put in the British spelling. 
And then you finally get to the retina. By the way, notice there's an optic nerve. That's where the light signals are transmitted to the brain. One problem. Is it not drawing up there? It is not. Come on, babe. Oh, boy. Well, clearly it's going to fail. You can see it still thinks my pen is down there bottom center. Um, <clears throat> well, I can still talk. It'll either disappear completely or come back. Where the optic nerve is, where you have the connection between the retina, the things that detect light in your brain, you're blind. You can't see at that point. So that means we all have a blind spot where the optic nerve is connected. I'm not sure what to do here. Because I want to change slides, and I'm pretty certain nothing good's going to happen when I change slides. I am going to disconnect and reconnect and hope and pray. We're going to have a clicker question next, so... Get ready with your clickers while I'm dealing with this. Okay, there we go. Didn't take long. What are the three primary colors of light? Obviously, I haven't talked about this yet. This is your preconceived understanding of light. What are the three primary colors? Okay, we had three people who said red, green, and blue, zero who said red, green, and yellow, five that said red, blue, and yellow, zero that said green, blue, and yellow, and one that said cyan, yellow, and magenta. Let us explore this. Our eyes have three types of cones in the retina. Our retina is made of rods and cones. Cone starts with a C. They're called this because they generally have shapes like this versus this. So they're called, they're named just based on their shape. The rods just sense light. We don't differentiate color based on the rods. We just differentiate light versus dark. We actually have much better precision with our rod vision. So the old school televisions, they would send a chrominance and a luminance signal. The chrominance was the color, the luminance was the light, and the luminance signal, the light signal, was very precise and had nice sharp details. The chrominance, the color, was not so precise. It was more blurry. But because the rods give us the precise vision, we would see the outlines clearly. The cones just add the color on top, not as precise, so just throw the color on more, splashing it in place. The rods are also much more sensitive. So if it's dark, like you wake up in the middle of the night, and the lights are off, of course, your roommate's not up studying, you can see with your rods but not your cones, which means that you see in black and white. So I used to keep a cup of water next to my bed all the time. It was a big gulp, red and white primarily. Wake up in the middle of the night and look at it, and it was gray and white. Why? Because I couldn't see colors. When you go out and look at stars, the stars have varying colors, but they pretty much always look white to us because there's not enough light for us to actually see the color. With some, they're bright enough and we can see it. So if you look at, for instance, um, Orion. Everybody knows Orion? The back armpit of Orion, Betelgeuse, is a red giant. It's a huge, huge star that is orangish in color. And you can see that it has an orange shade because it's really bright. And his front foot, Rigel, is a blue giant 
it's super hot, hotter things give off more blue, colder things give off more red. And so you can actually see that Rigel has a bit of a blue tint. But for most stars, you can't tell because they're not bright enough. Okay, so the cones. The cones come in three distinct types for most people. And so one cone is most sensitive in the blue range. I'm still in white. Change to black now. So one cone is most sensitive in the blue range. One cone is most sensitive in the green range. Now if you look at it, this here is more in the yellowish range where the peak of the last one is, but it is the most sensitive over here on the red region. And so when we name the three colors of light, we call them red, green, and blue because we have a cone that is most sensitive to red, a cone that is most sensitive to green, and a cone that is most sensitive to blue. That is, I will highlight uh, in magenta, the blue is most sensitive from there to there, right? That's where the blue cone is most sensitive. The green cone is most sensitive. I should have used. The green is most sensitive from there to there. And then the red cone is most sensitive from here all the way out. And so that's what gives us our three primary colors of light, red, green, and blue, because of the ranges where each of those cones is most sensitive compared to the others. So when we make up light, I have this projector. This projector is only putting out three colors. It's putting out red, it's putting out green, and it's putting out blue. But the red and green and blue are mixed with different intensities. And the way our brain works is essentially we have three sliders. We have a red slider and a green slider and a blue slider. The blue slider is saying, how much light am I seeing from blue cones? Might be filled to here. The green slider, how much light am I seeing from green cones? Might be filled to here. The red, how much light am I seeing from red cones? Might be way down here. So my brain says, okay, this much blue, this much green, this much red, what color is that? And the color that I would have here is essentially what I tried to make is blue plus green. Anybody know what color you get if you add blue plus green? That is blue plus green light. This what? Makes yellow. So that is how we get the colors we perceive. So what are the three primary colors of light? Red, green, and blue. Why are those the three primary colors of light? Knowing which ones they are is not nearly as important as the next one. Why? <coughs> because that's what the cones in our eyes see. Now, I'm not sure if I have... Yeah, I, so now I'm asking the question again. Okay, that's, that's a little depressing. What was the last thing I said? What are the three <laughs> primary colors of light? Red, green, and blue. Apparently, we had some who misheard there. Red, green, and blue because we have cones, one that's most sensitive to blue, one that's most sensitive to red, one's the most sensitive to green. So color mixing. Here we have three lights. This one here, green. This one here, blue. This one here, red. And their light is being mixed together on the screen. Let me zoom in. I know this is not the best picture in the world, but it's the one I got. So here's what we get when we mix that light. 
So now we can see exactly what Rachel answered. If we mix the green light and the red light, but we don't have blue, then we have yellow. Yellow for red and green. What color do we have if we mix red and blue? I pointed to blue and said red, and then I got confused on where I was going next. Okay? Magenta is the technical name. Purple is okay. Violet is not okay. Violet is a single frequency. It's not a mixture of colors. Even though the brain pretty much sees violet and magenta as the same, if you use color filters, you can distinguish them. They're very different. It's just the way our brain sees it. What about, and this one's the hardest one to see here, if we mix the green with the blue? Okay, that's the color we call cyan. So cyan is a complement to red. Complement because if we mix all three colors together, what do we have in the center? White. So cyan plus red gives me white. Magenta plus green gives me white. Yellow plus blue gives me white. So these colors here, cyan, yellow, magenta, they're the complementary colors to the primary colors. So we can call them the secondary colors. Or some people might do artwork. I don't. I think I have a slide on the artwork here, though. Well, when you are painting something or making a shirt, we have this Copper Mountain shirt that is orangish in color. I have light from the lights above that are hitting this shirt. How do I get orange if I have white light hitting the shirt? Okay, it's absorbing things that aren't orange. Now, orange is a rather complicated color. I should have gone with something simple, like the inner lining of Colby's jacket. He's got blue. Blue is one of our primary colors. So I have white light, red light, green light. I have a whole spectrum, but my eye just basically sees those three. What's being reflected by that inner blue lining of Colby's shirt? Just blue. So if it's reflecting blue, what's it doing to the other colors, to red and green? It's absorbing them. So Colby's shirt here is blue, which means that it absorbs red and green. So let's imagine that I take Colby into a room where we're developing film. Film tends to be not very sensitive to red light, so they'll use a red light bulb in there so you can see stuff that's not going to affect the film. So I take him in there and we just have red light. The red light hits his jacket lining. What do I see? Black. Why black? It's absorbing the only color that's hitting it. It only reflects blue. It absorbs the red so it would look black. So the color would look different. I run into this problem with my own wardrobe. We have these <laughs> um, compact, compact fluorescent bulbs in my closet. And I come in there and I look, and you might have seen I got a couple pair of ugly lime green, or not lime green, pea green pants I wear sometimes. And then I have a shirt that in that closet looks like it's brown, like it's going to go off good with the pea green. And so more than once I said, oh, this is a good match to my man's brain. I take the two and I throw them in my bag and I go to the gym. And after working out, I take a shower, it's important stuff, put my clothes on, and then I see, wow, they're almost exactly the same color. Why do they look different in my closet than they did when I put them on in the gym? It's the light that's hitting them. Each one is absorbing and reflecting different colors, and the colors that are being produced in my house with the compact fluorescent is just three colors, and it's not a full spectrum. When I go into a full spe spectrum, I see something different because I have more light to be absorbed and, and reflected. So if you're painting, because this is where most people learn about primary colors, from painting. If you're painting, you're using things like the material for your shirts and lining, things that are pigments. 
that absorb some light and reflect others. So for your pigments, you want pigments that will absorb one color, absorb one primary color. So if it absorbs one primary color, what does it do to the other two? Yeah, reflects them. So that means I want my pigments to reflect two colors. Well, on the previous slide where we added light, we saw what happened when I had two colors mixed. What were the three possible colors that I have when I mix two colors of light? We had cyan, yellow, and magenta. So these are the primary pigments, cyan, yellow, and magenta. So if you're, if you're painting, those are ideally the colors you would use. If you just had cyan, yellow, magenta, and a lightning agent, you should be able to make all the different colors. So in art class, that's what you generally think of as your primary pigments. But in art class, people still, I mean, that's where you guys got the answer that had five results. What was it, red, green, yellow, is that what you guys said? Yeah. Right. I never took art class, I never learned that set. But there is a historical reason for red, green, and yellow. And the historical reason is this. It used to be hard to find magenta pigments and hard to find cyan pigments. And so color theorists said, okay, I can't find a good magenta pigment. I can't find a good cyan pigment. Let's shift things a little bit. We won't be ideal. We'll be cutting some colors out of our gamut. But instead of magenta, let's just change that to an easy to find red. Instead of cyan, let's change that to an easy to find blue. Or, or was it green? See, I, I never learned these things. Was it green? Yeah, it was green. And so the colors are shifted, so it takes away a little bit, but these were easy to find. Nowadays, it's very easy to get pigments in all different colors, so there's no reason to use red, green, and yellow anymore, except for historical artists became comfortable with it, and... They just pass it down. I find this very interesting. I assume you all do too. Talk about reflections a little. There are two types of reflections shown in this picture. One is called specular. One is called diffuse. A specular reflection is a nice uniform reflection. A mirror gives you a specular reflection. A diffuse reflection is the light comes in and goes off in all directions. What's the primary difference? A quick way to tell when you look in a mirror, what do you see? Yeah, you, you see whatever is, light is hitting it comes to you and you can see it. You see the image. But when you look at something like his Copper Mountain shirt, I can't see a reflection of myself in that. It's reflecting light from me. I can't even tell that. The light from me is coming to it, and it's going off in all directions. So a specular reflection is mirror-like, and you can see images in the reflection. A diffuse reflection is not mirror-like. It's going off in all directions. What causes the difference? It's real simple. If I have a smooth surface, I get a specular reflection. If I have a rough surface, I get a diffuse reflection. Now for the personal question. What kind of reflection do you see off of the forehead of a friend? Is it specular or diffuse? I heard diffuse. Why did you say diffuse? <laughs> Felt good? Like that word better? What did you say, Denford? Yeah. 
Okay, that was actually where I was going to end up with. When you look at, well, don't use my forehead because my forehead probably gives you a fair amount of specular reflection. But when I look at Michaela's forehead, I can look all I want, and I am not going to see myself in her forehead. Hence, it's not a specular reflection, and that tells me that her skin isn't smooth. Of course, everybody knows that, right? You have pores in your skin and whatnot. It's not supposed to be smooth. So why did I say don't look in mine? Because you'll see a fair amount of specular reflection. It's what? Not saying I have smooth skin. Sweat. I don't know about you guys. It's hot in here to me. I'm sweating. And so I have a sheen of perspiration over my skin. And that water is going to form a smooth surface. And that smooth surface then will give a specular reflection. So the light that reflects off the front surface, which is actually only going to be about 5% of the light, but it's going to be a specular reflection from that 5%. And so you can see a little glare off of my forehead because of the sweat that's making it smooth. So one of the reasons to powder up the old face is so that you don't form that sweat layer that's smooth. The powder, you know, keeps it rough there. Good to know, right? Yeah. All right, we're getting to the end here. This I've already talked about, the selective color mixing. If I have a magenta pigment, it only absorbs the green and reflects the red and blue, giving me magenta. The cyan pigment only absorbs the red, mixes the green and blue, gives me cyan. The yellow, of course, absorbs blue and gives me back the red and green for yellow. I said this has red, green, and blue. We call it an RGB projector. If you get a printer, what do you have to de describe the colors of your printer? Go ahead, say it, you're right. Okay, well, we usually use abbreviations. It's usually C, Y, M, K. C stands for? Cyan, Y4, M4, magenta. Those are our three primary pigments. Your inks are pigments. So we have cyan, yellow, magenta. What about the K? Okay, a student corrected me a few years ago. It actually doesn't stand for black. It stands for something else like blank or something. It's one of my computer science majors. Um, but it is the black ink. So K is the black ink, but it doesn't actually stand for the word black. Don't put that in your potential test question. <laughs> key. key, okay, key. Did you look it up? Okay. I was like, man, how do all the students know these things I don't know? So can you make full color pictures with a printer that's CYMK? Yes. Yes, because you're once again going to be reflecting the three primary colors of light, and depending on how much of each type of pigment you have, you get a different amount of those colors in a different color. There are some people, oh, yes, I have to ask this question. You can't answer yet. After this, I will go on to what I was saying. What are the three primary pigments? Okay, we did... Better, still have one person who's not getting what I'm saying. It was cyan, yellow, and magenta, the three primary pigments. Red, green, and blue were the primary colors of light. We need to be able to distinguish those. Okay, there are some people, all of this started with, we have three cones. We have a red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone. There are some people that we call tetrachromats. They have a fourth cone. And if you have a fourth cone, what is that going to do? You can see more colors. You have four different colors you're mixing instead of three. Basically, the way it's generally conceived is our brain can perceive about 100 different gradations of each color. And so a normal person can see 100 times 100 times 100, 100 cubed, or a million colors. A tetrachromat has another hundred multiplied that, 
so they can see about 100 million colors, which is pretty awesome, right? And so how do you know if a person is a tetrachromat? Well, they do have some vision tests they're trying to develop to see if you can tell the difference in colors. But primarily, when a person dies, you dissect their eyeball. Now, you could always pluck it out and dissect it before they're dead, but that kind of ruins things for them. So they do research. Right now, they are actively conducting research on people that are believed to be tetrachromats. Then when they die, they'll dissect the eyeballs. And if they really were, the research becomes valid. <laughs> but it's kind of cool that that can happen. Now, who tends to be tetrachromats? Can you give me a guess? What do you say? I still can't hear you. I think women. you're right. Yes, women. Women tend to be the tetrachromats. Who tends to have color problems? Guys. Men, yes. It is a sex-linked or something like that um, genetic thing. And the vast majority of people with color blindness issues are males because of that sex link portion. And there's lots of different colors, kinds of color blindness, but I'm out of time. I will see you guys on Friday.